Today, we're gonna to drive all the way from Phoenix, Arizona up to Flagstaff, Arizona, which is almost 180 miles. What that means is this is a real range test for a Mustang Mach-E because how difficult is it to get up the hill? We're going up in elevation over a mile, which means that the range that I'm getting stated here, 269 miles, is not really what I'm gonna get. I'm gonna eat up more miles than that. So what I really wanna know is, does this car work for an everyday car, including long road trips? Does it function the way that I hope an EV does? Is it a serene, amazing cruising experience? Is it a premium drive? Can I hear the stereo well? Does it haul all my stuff? Let's find out. This is my first experience driving a Ford EV, but it's not my first experience driving an EV in general because I've driven three Teslas. That's two Model 3s and one Model S Plaid. Now this Mustang Mach-E has less than half the horsepower of that Plaid, but really that thing was ridiculous. Nobody needs that. So let's see how well this thing does getting on the freeway and going up the hill. I do have three different drive modes, Whisper, Engage, and Unbridle. We've got some pretty overt like horse analogies going on here with this thing, but let's turn back on propulsion sound. Why not? As we get on the freeway here, let's see how it feels. Ready, set, go. I like the propulsion sound. It's really not that violent. It's not that crazy. It just feels like a very normal car that has adequate power. So right now we're cruising along at 77 miles an hour going up the I-17 towards Flagstaff, Arizona. And it needs to get me there on one charge. Darn it. It's got the extended range battery, so I should have no problems whatsoever. But if I do have a problem or if I am curious, I need to be able to stop and charge when I want, in theory, as long as they work. Little update here as we get closer to Flagstaff. You can see the San Francisco peaks there in the distance. And let's talk about the mileage that we have left on this thing because whenever we started, we were supposed to be able to make it to our destination with upwards of 100 miles left. As it turns out, we are nowhere close to that. So right now what I'm showing is 39 miles left until empty, dry, dead, whatever you want to call it with a battery instead of a tank. And so what that tells me is, once I get to my destination, if the chargers there don't work, then I'm stranded. So this is my first case of range anxiety. Because if I knew for sure that they would work, I would go all the way there. Wouldn't be a problem. Just like I know there will be gas there. So if I was in a gas car, I would just go all the way there. I would be fairly low once I got there with maybe 20, 30 miles of range left. But that'd be fine. Who cares? It's different with an electric car because if for some reason the app is wrong and it tells me that there's 450 kilowatt charging stations there and for whatever reason they're not operational, well, then I'm stuck. Yes, I have the charger with me in the back of the car so I could plug in at someone's house or otherwise try and get some electricity, but then we're charging at two or three miles an hour. So now I'm stuck there for upwards of five hours to get a significant amount of range charged up to where I can go back to a bigger city where I know there's more chargers. So this is kind of a bummer. I think it's a pain because now what I've got to do is hedge my bets and say, do I just charge at the bigger city where I know something is going to be working, get full enough that I could go all the way to my destination and back and not worry about it because I've got to worry about these risks now? I think I do. I think that's my only course of action right now. Yeah, it's premium. I don't have to touch anything. It's very quiet. I've got a good stereo. It's very high tech and nice. But the low tech problem of can I make it to my destination is kind of a pain. Now, if I was just going to Flagstaff, I'd have made it totally fine because I still have 55 miles of range, which is about 25%. So for anyone wondering, the Phoenix to Flagstaff run of around 180 miles, no problem whatsoever. Seamless, easy. I, I would do it at the drop of a hat and not think anything of it. Even with a little traffic, because the I-17 is notorious for having traffic, I don't think I'd worry about it. But if you're gonna go beyond Flagstaff, if you're gonna really push the limits of the car, you do need to plan out where your EV stops are gonna be. And frankly, this is not a criticism of the car or of its abilities. The criticism is of the prevalence of charging and the charging network itself to make sure that it's there, it's reliable, everything is functioning the way it should. I don't know how to verify that outside of show up there and try and make it work 
where by now we all trust the gas station system so much that we just know that there's going to be a bunch of them and something's going to work. So I don't have to think about it. I think this is one of those cases where the charging networks themselves do need to catch up to the vehicles because the vehicles are here. They're functional, they're ready, they work, but the charging network isn't as developed. Okay, first Electrify America charging experience. Let's see how this goes. Network error, love it. All right, that charger had a network error. This guy's charging, they're charging, I'm not charging. So hopefully the last out of four chargers works so we can actually get somewhere today. Here we go. So we've got a Chevy, we've got a Kia, got a Ford here. What I had counted on working was using the Tesla chargers, but they have limited those to only certain ones that you're allowed to use as a non-Tesla, which means I can't use it. That's a pain. So now I have the four chargers here. One works. <laughs> so this gentleman in the Chevy Bolt just jumped out of his car and said he's almost done. So now I'm going to just sit back here and wait for him to be done and I'll snag his spot. But after being on hold with Electrify America for... Uh, nine minutes and sitting here trying two different chargers two different plugs on the one charger it looked like it was going to work but it's only a 150 kilowatt hour charger where the one that he's got is up to 350 kilowatts so for the sake of my future time i am going to go ahead and sit here and wait and be ready to get his spot long story long finally got it working went back to the first charger that the guy in the chevy was using it didn't work for a long time. It wouldn't accept my payment. It had me keep reconnecting to the car. I finally tried to connect with the Electrify America app through Apple Wallet because you can kind of scan it when you walk up and have it recognize you're a member because I had loaded a credit card into that app. That didn't work. I thought, what the heck, one more time, let's just try it with the credit card and see if it works. And suddenly it worked. I was ready to jump over here to another one. And then I would have tried three out of four of these chargers. So initially, if you thought my skepticism was a little unfounded, now you see that it was founded because I got here at 9.08 a.m. It's now 9.52 and I'm only 55% charged. So it'll be over an hour by the time this car is fully charged, which is kind of ridiculous compared to a gas car. But when Electrify America doesn't care about making their charging stations as reliable as they need to be, that's what we're up against. All right, an hour and 12 minutes later, we're finally able to get out of here. So I got 160 miles of range in an hour and 12 minutes. That probably would have taken six minutes at a gas station. Not the fault of the car, the fault of Electrify America. If the question in our mind is just range anxiety in general, like is 270 miles of range enough to get me a substantial distance and make a road trip possible? As of today, I believe so because I was skeptical before now, but after having taken this Mustang Mach-E all the way up to Flagstaff and now to Williams, 270 miles of range is a lot. And I feel like the way that Ford estimates the range is pretty accurate too. I feel like the only problem is whether or not these chargers are reliable and work. And as time goes on, and as more manufacturers release electric vehicles, I think that there's nothing but improvement to be made for these. We've got to have more of them. We've got to have more reliability from them. And potentially Tesla could open up more of their chargers to us so that a road trip like this is even easier because their system seems to be the most reliable so far. If you needed to use a Tesla supercharger in like a major city, those were available to me in and around Phoenix. So it wasn't a problem if you were using this as your everyday car. It was only in this super extraneous situation where you're taking your EV on a road trip that you would need to think about, hey, how do I charge this thing? How far am I gonna go? How long am I gonna stop? In a situation like this for me, it's a little bit of a learning curve because I'm not used to this and I was just setting up all my accounts for the first time and I'm getting this figured out. Now that I've done it, now that I have all the accounts set up, it's a lot easier. I'm charging away here, $2.40. In my experience too, electricity has also been cheaper than gas. And so that's really nice. So in terms of a luxury vehicle experience, EVs promise a lot, I think. It's just, if you're looking for that, if you want a luxury experience, and if you're willing to do a little bit extra 
than you normally had to do to get gas could be great for you. Now I'm at Luscious Williams, Arizona, right behind Grand Canyon Brewery here, and found that there are 350 kilowatt fast chargers. And it was perfect. Without a hitch, no worries. Literally took me less time to set this up than it does to get gas. And if I was staying at the La Quinta Inn, then I'd be double set. There's even some fake grass here for my fake dog. Let's go see how fast I'm actually getting as far as a charging rate. Actually, I can check on my phone. 95 kilowatts, so not that fast. But wow, that was seamless. If it was always that seamless, I would have no qualms with an EV. My experience at the Walmart for an hour and 12 minutes was not so great. Thus far in everyday use like this, I have no range anxiety whatsoever. I know I've got hundreds of miles left. I'm not worried about it. I'll charge at home for the next 18 hours and get upwards of 90 or 100 more miles of range, which is plenty for me to get home. And then I can charge up one more time if I need to before I give this car back. So I feel like the range anxiety woes are overblown by people who are looking at extraneous circumstances. It's kind of like the feedback that I get from people who leave comments on my Ford Maverick videos when I'm saying, hey, I'm gonna buy this Ford Maverick, this tiny little truck that everyone knows is tiny. And guys say something like, wow, a front wheel drive truck? Good luck with that, what could go wrong? I'm like, okay? Or people say, get a real truck, buy a diesel. Obviously, there are times when you would use the full capabilities of a giant vehicle, like a truck. But, for the vast majority of the time, you don't need that. I'm alone in a car, 99% of the time I drive like I am right now, I'm the only one in here, me and you. So for that purpose, the Ford Maverick serves me really, really well. For the one or two times a year I need something big, I can borrow it or rent it. It's not a big deal. And the rest of the time I'm saving tons of money. I think people use a similar kind of decision-making framework when they think about their range anxiety. Oh, well, I can't buy an EV. It's only got 280 miles of range. What if I wanna to drive to New York tomorrow? Okay, but are you driving to New York tomorrow? Is that a thing? How often are we really going on road trips that require frequent stops, frequently emptying the tank and filling it back up in a short period of time to keep going? Probably pretty seldom. I would guess for most of us, it's three times per year or less, in which case it's similar to my little Maverick. Yeah, the 99.9% the .9 of the time that you use it every day, it's fantastic. I don't have to worry about any kind of range anxiety, any kind of charging station anxiety, all of that is totally a moot point because it's all happening at my house. Yeah, if I'm going on a road trip, I've got to plan extra hours in there, not a few minutes here and there, literal hours, because it's no joke to get this charging situation figured out when you've got to be, uh, when you've got to be handling the, the woes of Electrify America and other networks when they don't have their own stuff figured out. With an EV, of course, one of the benefits is that when you're at home in the garage, you're charging. So I've got the 120 adapter on here so that I can have it plugged into this little transformer box that's got the nice Ford logo on there. That runs down through this nice thick cable over here to the car. And as I sleep, I'm filling up with power. Is it totally free power? No, we'll get it on the electricity bill. But the fact is that my wife's Explorer is not filling itself up with gas overnight as we sleep. Benefits of the Mustang. That was weird. It's like the Mustang knew its name. Mustang. Okay, good. So I think I have the best summary of what it's like to live with and charge an EV, an electric vehicle. It's both the most convenient thing you can possibly imagine because you can charge it here at home overnight for example, I've added 70 miles of range overnight. Cost us pennies, cost me no time whatsoever. I'm here at home, it's absurdly convenient. And it's also the most inconvenient experience because sometimes the chargers don't work. Sometimes they charge a lot slower than you need when you're counting on it. So if you're going on a lot of road trips, that can be really inconvenient. But as a day-to-day -day car around your house, using it like 99% of us do, it is unbelievably convenient and almost like heartwarming in a way that you're just sleeping and the car is filling itself back up with range. It's amazing. And I love the idea of never having to go to a gas station again. I don't want to spend my life at a gas station. I'd rather be at home, let the car fill itself up and be done. Even just plugged into a 110 outlet and getting one kilowatt of power, 
I've still gotten 70 miles of range. If you could plug into a 220 outlet at home, like one that feeds a dryer, it would charge significantly faster and would be a totally viable option for everyday use. You would never have to go to a charging station. As I get ready to head home and drive the 180 miles back from Flagstaff down to Phoenix, I decided to try and get a few more miles in here just to be safe in case there's traffic. And it's taken me about 20 minutes to get an available and working charger because only three out of four of these even work. But it's interesting because you can see that the main demographic for these EVs right now is this mid-sized crossover kind of vehicle. We got the Mach-E. We got the Nissan version of the Mach-E, basically the Araya. And then we've got a Subaru. Subaru Sol Solterra. But they're all shockingly similar in shape, in size. They've all got little design cues to try and make them stand out from the regular SUVs, but by and large, they are very similar vehicles serving a very similar segment. When I started this road trip, I expected to not have any problems charging. I expected to use the Tesla chargers. I expected to have plenty of range. And as it turns out, only one of those three things was true. I did have plenty of range. That's a decent amount of range for a normal vehicle. The problem comes in when you try and use a modern day non-Tesla EV as a road trip car. There simply is not enough infrastructure for this. And I think that that's a pretty dissuading factor for me and probably for anyone else who's looking to buy a car. I was just talking to a buddy at work and he said that his brother-in-law was gonna come and buy a Kia EV6. He was all excited about it. He did all the research. The car gets fantastic reviews. The problem is how will he use it day to day? If you have another car that you can use when you need to travel far, I think that's totally fine. Or if you know it's only gonna be kind of a city runabout, you're not gonna have a reason to go on a road trip or travel far, by all means. The EV is a fantastic second or third car or a city runabout. But as it stands, as a one and only car that may need to serve long distance duty for you, or maybe you're an irresponsible person and you don't always remember to charge it up at home, I just can't in good conscience recommend it for anybody. It has that weird dual nature of being so convenient to charge it at home and then so incredibly inconvenient to charge literally anywhere else. It's kind of a nightmare. In my experience driving Teslas, the charging experience is pretty seamless. Yeah, it does take longer than charging, huh, charging, than filling up with gas. You don't have to charge the gas. But I feel like it's still so seamless that it isn't something you couldn't get used to. But now the fact of the matter is that until this EV network gets better, I would steer clear of an EV probably entirely. I'm not in love with Teslas in general. And so for me, when they've got the best charging network and everyone else is still playing catch up, I just don't see a reason to buy an EV. I think a lot of people and a lot of companies and a lot of lawmakers thought that this would be a solution to climate issues, to people's desire to have a new vehicle, to a lot of problems being solved. And I just don't think that's true. I don't think we're going to solve our problems by buying new EVs. There's still a lot of development yet to go when it comes with internal combustion engines. We're really just still scratching the surface on something. If you look up something like Koenigsegg's free valve engine, there is a ton of development left in the internal combustion world. Plus, we have things like synthetic fuels that Porsche and others are developing that could be pretty darn green. So I don't see the end of the internal combustion engine happening anytime soon. To see more of this Mustang Mach-E, including my full review and how it ranks on the fun-to-drive score, click here for this video next, and I'll see you next time. Bye.